Good evening. Welcome. I'm happy to see you here. And I'm, I'm especially delighted uh, about this sp special uh, uh, session of the MIT Communications Forum. I'm David Thorburn, professor of literature and director of the forum, beginning in January for the 20th year. And it uh, is a kind of pleasure for me uh, to introduce our, our moderator this evening, uh, Seth Mnookin, who is the associate director of the forum, and my expectation is will be my successor. Uh, I think he's been doing wonderful work, and I'm very excited about his presence as associate director of the forum. Perhaps I can introduce the entire event by uh, mentioning that something like 15 years ago, I gave a talk to a, a, a rather elite group uh, in, uh, in Aspen, Colorado, called the Broadcasters' Convention. And they were elite, very wealthy broadcasters, people from all the major networks. Uh, and. Uh, I was the only uh, professor of human, of, in any humanistic discipline at this event. <clears throat> so I uh, introduced myself by saying how pleased I was to be there and uh, how especially happy I was that they were inviting a humanist. And I heard strange grumbling in the audience, didn't understand, and I went and gave my speech, but, they, but it didn't, I thought I was very good, but they didn't seem to respond very effectively. Later, a friend of mine who'd been in the audience told me I'd lost them at the beginning because they thought humanist meant human being. <laughs> I hope our audience doesn't make that error. <laughs> Seth. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, David. Uh, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm just going to stand up for the introduction so no one mistakes me as being part of this incredibly illustrious panel. Um, the format for the evening, we're going to talk among ourselves for roughly the first hour uh, and then take questions from all of you for the second hour. Um, a reminder, which I will remind you of again when we begin the questions, um, please just identify yourself when you ask questions. Uh, this is being recorded, and an audio uh, recording and a video recording will eventually be online. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce the four panelists here tonight. Um, James Carroll, who is to my immediate left, uh, is an historian, novelist, and journalist. Um, his many works of fiction and nonfiction include An American Requiem, which won the National Book Award, um, and Constantine Sword, now an acclaimed documentary. Uh, he writes frequently about Catholicism in the modern world, uh, and in fact has a book coming out in a couple of weeks, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, called Christ Actually the Son of God for the Secular Age, um, putting us all to shame. He also just published a novel uh, several months ago called Warburg in July. Um, and uh, he, in addition to all that, he's a prize-winning columnist for the Boston Globe and a distinguished scholar in residence at Suffolk University um, in Boston. Uh, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, who is to Jim's left, is a philosopher and novelist um, and the author of 10 books, including most recently, 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, a work of fiction, and Plato at the Googleplex, Why Philosophy Won't Go Away. Uh, she was named the World Economics Forum, she was named to the World Economics Forum Global Council of Values, and was also named the Humanist of the Year by the American Humanist Association in 2011. So um, what better person to, uh, to help represent the humanities? Um, she's the recipient of numerous awards for her scholarship in fiction, including a MacArthur Fellowship. Alan Lightman, um, uh, who was part of the reason why we're all here today, which I'll explain in a moment, is a physicist, novelist, and essayist. Um, in astrophysics, he's made fundamental contributions to gravitation theory, the behavior of black holes, um, and radiation processes in extreme environment, environments. Uh, his 1993 novel, Einstein's Dream, was an international bestseller. Uh, and in 2000, his book, The Diagnosis, was a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction. He is currently a professor of the practice at human in humanities at MIT um, and teaches with me in the graduate program in science writing. Uh, Robert Weinberg, um, at the end of the table, is one of the world's leading molecular biologists um, and the person who discovered the first gene known to cause cancer. Um, his work focuses on the molecular and genetic mechanisms that lead to the formation of human tumors. Uh, and his recent work has examined how human cancer cells metastasize. 
1997, President Bill Clinton awarded him the National Medal of Science, which is the nation's highest scientific honor. Uh, he also is here at MIT as a professor of biology and a founding member of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. Um, so the genesis for this conversation here was actually a communications forum that was held uh, last spring that Alan participated in. Um, it was called Science in Fiction, uh, um, along with a novelist named Hanya Yanagihara. And during the question and answer period, um, Alan and uh, uh, the head of the literature program here, Mary Fuller, um, began talking about some of the differences in sciences and the humanities. Uh, and Mary and Alan and I all thought that this would be a great topic to explore further. Um, so we're gonna start just with some brief opening statements from all four panelists, and then we will be off and running. So, Jim, you can start. Good evening, folks. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, not least because I take the honor of being invited to address a weighty question, but I'm also quite grateful to be on the panel with th these th three folks, four, including Seth, but three to my left whom I esteem and regard uh, having in encountered them powerfully in important ways for myself over the years as friends, so it's a special privilege. I expect to learn a lot. I remind myself now of Admiral Stockdale. You may remember Admiral Stockdale, who ran for vice president with Ross Perot. And at the uh, vice president's debate, he began by saying, who am I and what am I doing here? Uh, he also said when he was asked a question, I think it was about Medicare, uh, I'm out of ammunition on that one. <laughs> Ad, Ad, his greatest uh, distinction at that point was he was a hero of uh, captivity during the Vietnam War, a man who really was a hero in his youth. And uh, alas, in his later years, uh, got caught looking ridiculous. I hope that's not what happens to me here tonight. I wondered what I, uh, how I could identify myself at, to, in effect, have a credential to be in this conversation. And what occurred to me to say, simply, is that I'm a Christian humanist. And I'd like to just put on the table for our conversation uh, two figures who've been extremely important in my own intellectual life. One is Peter Abelard, whom you may remember as an early 12th century philosopher, theologian. It's a distinction that wouldn't have meant much to him. He was a scholar in Paris and was engaged in an enterprise that evolved eventually into the University of Paris. He's most well known because of his affair with Eloise, uh, which got him castrated, uh, banished, silenced, and uh, basically removed from a position of real influence uh, in the life of Christendom. The point about Abelard for me is that he was an anti-crusader at the point when the Crusades were defining not just the politics of Europe, nascent, new, newly born Europe, defining the politics of Europe, but also the ideology of Europe. And Abelard was a dissenter from the ideology that took hold of the European mind in important ways. But the most important thing about him, in a way, was what he was part of initiating. So he was a Latin scholar who was benefiting from the arrival in Europe of the Greek classics translated by the Iberian Peninsula translators, Muslim and Jewish and Christian, but mainly Muslim and Jewish. And you know this story well. Uh, Rebecca's an expert on it. The, the way in which the arrival of Aristotle in the mind of Latin Europe enabled a kind of recovery, not from Plato, but from Neoplatonism, which had been a deadly, uh, stult, a stultifying uh, ideology in the mind of Europe and the Christian world as it evolved into Christendom. And the arrival of those great texts, especially Aristotle, transformed the mind of Europe as it was coming to be and initiated what I recognize, at least, as a tradition of Christian humanism, a real embrace of basic human value. And the second and great figure uh, in track with Abelard was Thomas Aquinas a century later. So the 13th century, by then 
texts of Aristotle, much more broadly available, really defining Arist uh, Thomas Aquinas' thought. Our subject is knowledge and how human, the humanities, knowledge in the humanities might uh, differ, does it differ from knowledge in the sciences? And uh, for me, Aquinas is the perfect touchstone for the beginning of our conversation because, again, for him, that distinction, the humanities and the sciences, wouldn't have meant much to him. It was all knowledge. And the thing that really struck me when I began to think about this was the Summa Theologica, uh, Aquinas's great work, which in this was an era when you could still attempt to summarize all that is known. So in that work, he's summarizing all that is known about theology. But what was striking to me was the subtitle of that work was The Nature and Limits of Human Knowledge. So it's a work, Summa Theologica, that is summarizing all that we know about God. But the subtitle is The Nature and Limits of Human Knowledge. So to talk about God is to talk about human knowledge. That's what's interesting to me. And I want to just make five quick points about knowledge for our discussion. I probably will be the only person to make this, uh, offer this frame of reference, because it's eff effectively the frame of reference of a, of a believer, of someone for whom the discussion of knowledge is incomplete if it somehow doesn't grapple with the question of God. Although Rebecca knows more about the proofs of God than anybody else I know, although with Aquinas, he only had five proofs of God. The point number one, I know what, what Aquinas calls sensory knowledge. Point number two, I know that I know, which is human knowledge. Dogs know, but humans know that they know, which is the beginning of self-consciousness. Consciousness can explain everything, which is the principle of science, as I understand it except itself, which is the principle of the limits of science, as I understand them. I know that I know includes I know that I do not know. So the limit of knowledge is essential to knowledge. And in Aquinas, that leads to his th thinking about the via negativa. The way to know is to begin with what is not known. And the only things we can know for certain about God is that we do not know God. So not knowing is a form of knowing. And finally, for him, the crucial thing is that the experience I know, moving to I know that I know, moving to I know that I know and that what I do not know, leads to the experience of being known. I know, I know that I know, I know that I am known. There's a pre-rational, primordial assumption of being known. And knowledge points to that knower. So all knowing has an analogical character that moves inevitably toward, as I see it, the one who knows. The purpose of knowing, and this is my final point, as Aquinas said, is not knowing, but love. Where does knowing aim to go. It aims to go to love. Love takes off, takes up, he said, where knowledge leads off. All right, thank you. Um, and uh, if, if Cora's here, if someone's here and wants to close that door um, out to the hall, that'd be great. Uh, OK, Rebecca. Well, actually, Alan and I decided to switch. You're going to switch. OK, yeah. so Alan. I mentioned to Rebecca that I might ruffle her feathers, so she said I should go first. Um, um, so I can respond. <laughs> I'm happy that to see all of you here. Uh, the topic tonight is very dear to my heart. Um, I'll be brief and get directly to uh, the point. Um, I think that both the sciences and the humanities are seeking understanding and truth but those truths are different, in my view. In science, <clears throat> the truth is the external, inanimate, disembodied world of atoms and stars and neurons. In the humanity, humanities, the truth ultimately 
lies in human beings, our natures, our society, our values, our motivations, our actions. These are profound differences, and I think they need lead to many other differences. Um, one difference is in the nature of proof. Uh, the mind of a human being, uh, the human mind is, is far more complex than any physical system that we know of, any other physical system. Um, even neuroscientists who study the brain haven't yet begun to approach um, the complexity at the level needed to understand thought, consciousness, self-awareness, aesthetic judgment, motivation, and Professor Weinberg can correct me later here. Because human beings are ambiguous and full of contradictions, the humanities cannot prove things about history or literature or philosophy in the same way that a physicist can prove that a drop ball falls a distance proportional to the square of the time of the falling, or the way that a biologist can prove that the way that a nerve cell communicates with another nerve cell is by releasing dopamine or acetylcholine. There's a sense of rightness and wrongness with the scientific theory. You can prove that Einstein's theory is superior to Newton's theory. It's far more accurate in accounting for all gravitational phenomena. You can't prove that Jeremy Bentham's theory of, of utilitarianism is more or less correct than John Locke's social contract theory. That doesn't mean that Bentham and Locke are not brilliant and stimulating thinkers. Of course they are. A closely related idea is the repeatability of phenomena in science versus the singular nature of events in the humanities. The humanities often deal with people and events living in a particular era or a particular social milieu. And it's impossible to exactly repeat the conditions to test an hypothesis. In science, with the exception of cosmology, experiments can be repeated thousands of times because the conditions of the experiment can be recreated in the laboratory. Hypothesis testing is far more definitive in science because of this aspect of repeatability. In fact, many humanists would not describe their work as hypothesis testing at all. Ambiguity is more important in the humanities. In fact, scientists hate ambiguity. Scientists want clear, crisp answers to their questions. A swinging pendulum is not ambiguous. You can measure the length of its swing, the length of time for a swing, precisely as a function of the length of the string. You can write down an equation that accurately predicts the position of the pendulum at a future time. By contrast, you can't predict the actions of a human being in a particular situation unless it's a very simple situation, and you, and you cannot predict the actions of a nation of human beings. That ambiguity in human actions, which is uh, always a good sign of a good character in literature, is a result of the es essential complexity and unpredictability of the human mind and the inability to isolate all of the forces that affect human behavior. That doesn't mean that there aren't many interesting, important questions in the humanities. Certainly, there are. It's just that these questions often do not have unique and definitive answers, as questions do in the sciences. And I wanted to end just by saying, and I hope Rebecca's been a little stirred up here, um, <laughs> I just wanted to end by saying that, that personally, I'm very happy to be living in a world that has both certainty and ambiguity. When I'm flying in an airplane, sitting in a 500-ton machine that's thousands of feet up in the air, I'm very happy for the certainty of physics and aerodynamics. But when I'm meeting a new friend or making or debating a moral issue, 
or analyzing the social forces on my favorite novelist, I find that the ambiguity and the subtlety and the multiple points of view engage me far more than would a single and sterile answer. All right, thank you, Alan. So I guess the question is, Rebecca, did he, uh, did well, he stir I'm you up there? Well, <laughs> um, Well, I, I'm, it's a great pleasure to be here. And this is, again, for me, um, an issue that, uh, that really resonates with me. Um, I started out college um, uh, in physics. And I, in fact, got all the way through. Um, and applied to graduate school in physics, but I was taking a class in quantum mechanics. And I kept asking um, my professor, um, how do we interpret this? And he was of that school, um, the, the answer, I mean, what I was asking was, what is reality like according to, according to this theory? And he, his answer to me was basically various variations on um, shut up and calculate. And finally, he said to me, um, why don't you go talk to the philosophers? They ask this kind of meaningless question. And so I did, and, um, and ended up going to graduate school um, in philosophy, uh, studying philosophy of physics. And then somewhere along the line, also began to write novels. So I feel like um, the sciences, the humanities, and the arts are, are I have an equal stake in all of them and passionately love all of them. Um, but I think an awful lot about the difference between the sciences and the humanities, and, I, and in particular, one humanity, uh, one of the humanities, philosophy, which I think is rather different uh, from the other humanities. And I mostly, I'm going to head that way in my comments. There are two kinds of questions uh, that we wrestle with in order to try to make sense of our of, of our lives, uh, make sense of everything. Uh, there are questions of what is, and there are questions of what matters. Um, and it's not as if these questions are completely separate from each other. Uh, they have, they uh, have connections with one another. For example, uh, we can ask whether it matters that we know what is. Uh, why should that really matter that we know what is? But we do. You know, we come into this universe, and we want to know the ontological furniture. What kind of world is this? Uh, what, and which is also a question of, of what are we? Um, sometime, it didn't really begin in the Greek world. The roots are in the Greek world. But sometime around the 16th, 17th century, uh, we came up uh, with uh, an amazing conglomeration of different cognitive techniques uh, that have helped us discover what is. Um, and that conglomeration of a priori mathematics and observation, theory, and intuition is, is called science. Science is our best means of telling us what is. Uh, because uh, what science did uh, uh, develop, it's not just intuition or a priori uh, reason or, um, or observation. Uh, science developed this technique of getting reality, getting nature to answer us back when we're getting it wrong. This is incredible that we came up with this. And I very much credit Galileo for this, uh, one, of my, one of my heroes. Um, even though he was such a Platonist, was Galileo, uh, that in one of his letters he said that if my critics weren't so stupid, I could persuade them through pure uh, a priori reason. Uh, but because they're so stupid, I have to perform experiments. So we can be very happy that uh, Galileo's critics were so stupid. Uh, because this is an amazing thing. Uh, we come at, you know, our, our intuitions are very, very faulty. Even the most basic of our intuitions about space, time, causality, identity. Um, and we have developed this way of setting things up so that when we, you know, 
reality gets a chance uh, to correct us. Oh, so you think simultaneity is absolute, do you? It seems perfectly intuitively obvious to you. Does it? Well, we'll just see about that, right? Relativity theory. Um, all sorts of all sorts of ways in which our intuitions have been shown to be false. So when it comes to what is uh, science all the way, of course, I've just given a philosophical um, argument uh, in favor of that. Uh, so that science, in and of itself, often has to depend on philosophical arguments. Uh, I've just given. I, I haven't really given the argument, but I'm. Uh, implying scientific realism. That's a philosophical position. It takes an argument. Um, OK. Uh, so what are the humanities good for? Well, um, in addition to just uh, knowing what is, that world that we're, that we're in, um, there's this whole inner world of subjectivity. Uh, that is extremely important to us as, as human beings. It matters to us. It matters to us to know what kind of world we live in objectively. And also this inner world that we, uh, each of us individually, um, inhabit the world as it is for us, colored with our memories, our emotions, our aptitudes, our intuitions, uh, individually variable. Um, that's all very, very interesting to us. Um, and I think for the most part, the humanities are an exploration of that inwardness as it's informed by culture um, and, uh, and, and other factors, and it, as it varies from, from individual to individual. We're, we're interested in that, and we learn a, lo a lot about human nature uh, uh, by, by uh, studying this. We enrich our own. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. We enrich our own inner world uh, through this study of, of, of the humanities. Um, philosophy, I think, is very different. Um, that uh, philosophy, uh, you know, in, in the academy is set up in such a way so that every field has to belong to either the sciences, the social sciences, or the humanities. You know, philosophy certainly isn't a science. Uh, it, it's, it's not experimental. It doesn't probe reality in the way that, that science is, uh, it doesn't get reality to answer us back in the way that uh, sciences do, uh, do. It's not a social scientist science, so by default it's a humanities. But it doesn't really fit in there uh, with, with the humanities. It is not an exploration of uh, inner, inner subjectivity. Um, my bumper sticker answer to what philosophy is is that it is a discipline, um, a technique, uh, that tries to maximize coherence, uh, that tries to maximize our various uh, uh, intuitions. It tries to maximize the coherence between the scientific image um, of the world uh, that our latest science gives us um, and other intuitions that we need in order to live coherent lives. Uh, it also tries to maximize our um, moral coherence. There are certain uh, uh, intuitions we have, moral intuitions come very naturally to us. Uh, in fact, it's very, very hard to live one's life without committi uh, being committed to those, for, certainly as they apply to ourselves and our kin, probably uh, the results of uh, natural selection, what, uh, what, what evolution has, has yielded to us, but it's very hard to give these things up. Um, and philosophy uh, tries to see what other things are implied by these intuitions. So it's, a, in general, a, a, a way of trying to make us more coherent, uh, maximally coherent, trying to, um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to quote a, a philosopher here, Wilfred Sellers, a 20th century philosopher. He wrote a very good article. It was very helpful to me when I was battling whether or not, uh, it, it, agonizing whether or not to go on in physics or in philosophy, he wrote something called Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man. Um, what he said is the aim of philosophy, abstractly formulated, is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. 
Um, so this maximum, I'm bringing it all together. Remember, philosophy does have a technique. It's called the argument. Uh, that's how we, we don't have experiments. It's an argument. What does an argument do? An argument is something that explores consequences, uh, tries to reconcile uh, various aspects, just goes from maximum consistency, maximum coherence. Um, and uh, and that's, that's somewhat different from, from the exploration of inwardness of the, of the other humanities. Um, I'm going to end there. Did I ruffle your feathers? Not at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. Um, and Bob, we'll move on to you. Well, I, I, I for better or worse, uh, am a practitioner of a much more pedestrian discipline. Uh, biology doesn't have any major laws. Biology doesn't have the pretensions of having uh, profundities associated with it. Uh, biologists like myself are just cartographers. We're, we're travel guides, and we're trying to figure out what's been going on on this planet for the last three and a half billion years, trying to peel away onion layer by onion layer all of the rather arbitrary decisions that were made during the course of evolution. The Rube Goldberg-like contraptions that were cobbled together with greater or lesser success, and that ultimately ended up with the life forms that we now have on the planet. And uh, these uh, solutions that were arrived at were not preordained by any fundamental laws of physics. They just happened. They were contingencies. If uh, a, a meteor had not uh, landed uh, somewhere in the Yucatan 55 million years ago, it could be that the dinosaurs would still be supreme and we mammals wouldn't be here at all. There was no law of the universe that dictated that we intelligent beings would work on, uh, would walk on two legs and have two hands and maybe even two eyes. It just happened that way. Uh, Jim Carroll, as I've discussed with him on occasion, also to the extent he puts on the historian's hat, also deals with contingencies like, for example, what would early Christianity have been like had the temple in Jerusalem not been destroyed in the year 70? and the Bar Kokhba revolution uh, not uh, taking place in the year 130. Uh, these kind of historical accidents of real history are very much the same as the historical accidents that define the way life has evolved on Earth. Uh, and they humble one, and they make one uh, understand ultimately that people like myself must describe what happened, try to understand what happened, and be humbled by the fact that the life on this planet is infinitely complex and that we, we could spend the next 20,000 years, if we wish to do so, describing the different life forms that have arisen and trying to make sense of all this when maybe there isn't any sense. So uh, I, I will not try any uh, profundities here, but simply say that I'm just a travel guide. Uh, OK, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, so to start things off, it struck me as I was listening to you all that um, we've divided this up into sciences and the humanities. Um, and it seems like there are potentially at least these two other areas that um, we're possibly uh, uh, assuming belong in one or the other, and that's uh, the arts um, and the social sciences. And I think part of the initial discussion that arose um, uh, last spring was um, some of the tension between uh, literary theory and producing literature. Uh, to sort of simplify it in that way. Um, so, uh, Alan, I'll start with you. How do you see, do you see the social sciences as being part of the sciences, and do you see the arts as being the creation of art um, and literature and music as being part of the traditional humanities? Well, I don't think that you can lump all the social sciences together the same way Rebecca said that philosophy was not quite one of the humanities. Um, I mean, uh, if you take economics, for example, right. which I think is considered a social science. It, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. at MIT it is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well there's a huge range of, of, of styles and methods of doing economics. And some of it is very mathematical. And, and the economists just do computer models and they have mathematical models, and they test their models, and everything stays on the computer. Uh, and, and that is uh, 
That, that mimics the science. That mimics more. the science as, as long as there's some way that they can do experiments uh, to test the models. So, so would, would a difference there be that they're not um, reproducible in the way that a traditional science experiment would be? Because you can't go back and run different economic models on the world. You can't run different economic models on, on the world. You can run different economic models on a given set of starting assumptions that right. might have a random element, a Monte Carlo element right. in it. Um, and then, of course, then there are, there's the other extreme end of economics that is, uh, uh, deals very much with, with populations and might have a lot of similarities to the sociology. Right. So I think that there's, there's just too big a range of, of, of branches and styles of the social sciences. Um, so I think the social sciences can act like uh, what we're calling the sciences or the physical sciences, or they can act more like the humanities. Um, Rebecca, I think you have something to yeah. say about that. Oh, well, you know, um, there are all different approaches in the physical sciences as well. I mean, the, the way a, an experimentalist and a theoretical physicist operate are, are very, very different. Like, and the way you know, a biologist and a physicist or a chemist. I mean, there are, there are differences uh, within the physical sciences as well. I mean, the social sciences, well, yeah, I consider them science, sciences. They are trying to test things. And uh, they run tests, and they're trying to, uh, you know, it, it's, it's social groups that they're trying to test, uh, or in the case of psychology, you know, individuals. But they are. Um, they are they're running tests and trying to uh, correct their intuitions. And so, you know, I consider them to be, to be sciences. Um, I mean, the, the advance in the behavioral sciences and psychology, uh, you know, like over our lifetime has just been amazing. I do not consider psychology a science when I was an undergraduate. Um, it's now you know, very much that, appearing, yeah. you know, cognitive science, right. evolutionary psychology, uh, affective and uh, cognitive neuroscience. I mean, it, it's this is these are sciences. Um, but economics, there's still a lot of haziness because we're we're dealing with with uh, psychology, and there is there is a psychology of, of large groups, and there's a lot of uncertainty because of the complexity of the systems there. So, you know, but I, I think that they are, yeah, they are going that way. The methodology, it's empirical, it's testing, um, and they've made a tremendous <coughs> amount of, of, of progress. Um, what was it, did you ask something about the arts? Uh, well, we can, we can come back yeah. to that. That's, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah, Jim. Well, I, I'd like to ask a, a kind of dumb question, really, which is, e even though the distinction between the sciences and the humanities is useful in many ways in terms of our enabling us to sort out the enterprises involved in each. Isn't it also important to pay attention to the way in which it's a destructive dichotomy? <clears throat> Sends us down a kind of dead end road, um, maybe in both instances. Wouldn't we be better off if we were more comfortable uh, with a more um, inclusive category of knowing or knowledge? I mean, in, in a way, that, that was the That's point of my starting point, which was to go back to the time before there were these distinctions in the intellectual enterprise. Um, and for me, the issue is what we mean by knowing. Right. And uh, because I think that we know, whether in the sciences or in the humanities, exactly in the same way, which is that we, in, in the phrase that Alan was just using, we create models. Uh, we create uh, experiments. Uh, we create narratives. We create images. The intellect is a function of the imagination. And one of our problems is we imagine that the intellect and the imagination are separate faculties of the human person. And uh, the next thing you know, art and artists are expected to occupy a separate category of being where the disciplines of hardcore intellectual enterprise don't apply. Right. So that feeling justifies everything without being submitted to the discipline of thought, which is the end of art. 
So, and if we pay attention to the way in which narrative art, for example, the simple creation of a story, what Rebecca does when she writes a novel, uh, has to be submitted to every bit as rigorous a set of disciplines as the most uh, structured experiment that Robert conducts in his laboratory. Because it's, they're both bound by the same rules of knowing, which goes back to a, a sense of this enterprise that predates the deadly enlightenment uh, dichotomy between uh, rationality and emotional life, between, well, as it comes down to us, between the sciences and the humanities, between the hard sciences and the soft humanities, which uh, are denigrated by definition of the contrast with the more rigorous sciences. Well, I think it's, and, and we can circle around back to this, but I think possibly, or at least one of the ways that I conceive of the difference there is that while writing a novel or um, a poem or producing a piece of art requires uh, attention to both the discipline and discipline, um, there aren't the same rules across the board that there, that there would be in conducting a scientific experiment. So you could have four people writing novels who all are adhering to very different notions of what it means to produce that. But let's, let's maybe come back to that. Um, Bob, one thing I, I, I wanted to ask you about, because I know Alan's feelings on the subject, um, is uh, your feelings about, about ambiguity in results. Um, one of the things that really generated some of the excitement or some of the attention in the spring was Alan's um, statement, I think that scientists don't like ambiguity. Uh, I think you said it makes them, it makes them uncomfortable. Or maybe you just said they don't like it. Um, and so he, I was, he said it again. Right, yes, right. Yeah. Uh, but, and so I'm curious about, in your own work, how you feel about ambiguity, which, and I'm sure you must get that in results all the time. All, all the time, yes. Well, I feel I deprecated my, my discipline by saying it was only a higher form of stamp collecting. Right. Because the I thought, fact I that thought you were a, I thought you were a travel, a travel, a travel guy, guy, yes. But the, the fact of the matter is, in order to make very descriptors of how life is cobbled together, one needs to use very rigorous logic. One needs reproducible results. And one can say, I can say in an unambiguous fashion, that we hate ambiguity. That is to say, we are only comfortable and we only sleep well at night when we think we found out something that we can assert is unambiguously true and that other people can find to be true. It may not be a profound result in terms of the whole history of life on the planet or in terms of curing cancer, but for that little particle of observation and conclusion we make, that it will stand the test of time and it will still be true 10, 20, and 30 years from now. It may be elaborated upon, but its trueness is not uh, in any way contingent on the way that certain people might interpret what we have found. And so uh, to the extent Alan said that scientists hate ambiguity, he properly characterized us. And so do, do, do you, and, and Alan, you can jump in here too if, if you'd like. Um, do you feel like that uh, limits the questions that you ask? Definitely. That, that we ask? Yeah. Yes, it does, in the following sense, that if somebody in my laboratory proposes to do an experiment and I ask them, what kind of result are you going to get, and they forecast a range of possible results, I would say, well, which of those results will lead you to an unambiguous conclusion, will allow you to say solidly, this is true or this is not true. And if they can't propose a eventual uh, avenue that will lead them to some unambiguous conclusion, and I'm not talking about conclusions about the whole history of life on the planet, but even the structure of a small molecule, right. if they can't uh, converge on some unambiguous result, I'll look at them and be a little bit dismissive, at least in my physiognomy, as far as, the, uh, the, uh, as, far as how seriously I should take them and, and their proposed uh, trajectory. So does that mean that, um, I guess what I, what I, what I want to ask is, do, does that mean that there are questions that might lead you to results that could lead to different avenues that would give you unambiguous answers? Yes. That you're not asking because some of the intermediate steps along the way would, be, would, be, would have more ambiguity in them? Could, could well be, but people have to make a living. And, uh, and when I say that, I don't mean to trivialize uh, my craft, but the fact of the matter is they will say about this person or that person, uh, well, he claimed this and he claimed that and he's claimed three other things. And 
nobody can really reproduce that work. Maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. That's not a credible scientist, a credible biologist. Uh, now, it could be that, that the absolutely unambiguous results that he or she converges on uh, may be trivial and totally uninteresting, but at least they're solid. Right. Uh, that person also doesn't command a lot of respect if all they do is to uh, gather up the, the obs solid obscurantia of life <laughs> right. on this planet, uh, and there are many of those. Rebecca, did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, and, well, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I've been on book tour, and I'm just totally losing my voice. Um, one place in which I find um, a tremendous amount of ambiguity among scientists is in um, their description of what it is that they're doing when they're doing science. Um, and so, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the answers you've given, um, there are, the answer I often get from scientists is a sort of Karl Popperian view is uh, of that, uh, you know, we're, I'm not, in fact, I've been, I, I've had it objected when I say that science discovers what is. Um, a, a strict Popperian will say, and many scientists are strict Popperians, will say, no, um, we've only discovered what isn't. Uh, what we're, we're trying to do in science is to falsify. It's con conjecture and refutation. Right. Uh, it, nothing is going to stand up to the test of time. That's, that's, that is the definition of, of science. It's falsifiable. Um, well, I, uh, for me, uh, this Popperianism is amusing yeah. because it makes no sense. Well. It's interesting, but there is ambiguity. All I want to say is that there is sort of uh, ambiguity in, in terms of what it is uh, that one's actually doing and when one's doing science. So I'm just reading, actually, um, Stephen Hawking's latest book, The Grand Design. Um, I, and I'm guessing that Stephen Hawking is not reading your latest book, because what did he say in 2011? Philosophy is dead? Right. Philosophy is dead. And then he, so that's actually um, in this book, and uh, it's a maybe second or third uh, page, and then he proceeds to do philosophy, philosophy of science, to say what it is that, philosophy, that science is doing. And he has a kind of neo-Kantian uh, view, but not only is he doing uh, philosophy there, but he is um, doing it not very well. He, he contradicts himself. Sometimes he talks as if he's a scientific realist. Sometimes he talks as if he's not a scientific realist. Um, but there is complete ambiguity when it comes to what is it uh, that one is actually doing when one's doing science, because in fact, um, science itself can't answer that question. You're already going into the realm of philosophy of science when you do that, and that is full of ambiguity. So although in one, what's, what's interesting to me is I can get people who are collaborating in, on their work, they all agree on the science, they're collaborators, and they completely disagree on what it is that they're doing when they're doing science. Are they describing reality? Is it just a model? Well, that's not science. No, it's not. It's philosophy. I mean, if, that's you know, exactly if, my if, point. If, yeah. If Professor Weinberg, you know, finds a, a, a gene that causes cancer, and he's able to manipulate it. You know, at some point in the future, they might be a, a, a drug or a method of using that to cure cancer. If you ask him to say what he's doing, yeah. and uh, he has a bunch of different explanations, and somebody else may have a, diff a different set of explanations about what he's doing. Those explanations of what he's doing is not science. The thing that he did is science, but the discussion of what it is is philosophy. That's what's my point. Well, I, I, this really makes me want to make my point again, which is that distinction, is, there's something problematic about that distinction. Because I don't about I think the distinction it, between the philosophy of science and well, science? Yes, or as I take. Rebecca's way of putting it, the distinction between those who ask what is and those who ask what does it mean? And I think if you, if you assign those questions to separate projects and separate people and separate a enterprises and separate systems of funding, separate academic uh, distinctions, something inhuman is happening. That's my intuition. I, I can't say more than raise this question. Uh, I mean, I, we can all think of, uh, and I, as I hear Robert describe his commitment to the question, what is, 
I hear also in the way you, you pose it a, a, a firm commitment to the question, what does it mean? You may not, well, you yes. may not put that forward as your question, but I hear that in your, and you're the kind of scientist who asks what is as a way of asking what does it mean? I, I won't deny that, but I won't move back from the first step, which is, is there any kind of objective reality? Uh, if you, let's say I'm a cartographer, let's call that a science, and I describe the shape of the continents, and the shape of the continents is the consequence of a whole series of contingencies, geological contingencies over the last four and a half billion years. Are these, uh, are, are the maps of the, of the world, uh, are they real? Are they only uh, artifacts of our perception? Mm -hmm. And in the same sense, um, is my description of the structure of a gene or the structure of a cell or a protein, is that a reality or is it just a matter of my own subjective interpretation? And I'm very reluctant to, inter to embrace the second idea, the second alternative. Um, I that it's your that subjective interpretation. Yes, You're reluctant. Uh, but why are those, uh, why can't it be a reality in being your subjective perception? Why, why do we need this, it sounds almost platonic to me, this radical divide between what's real and what we perceive? So the map of Spain is not Spain, where there's an old saying that Maine lobstermen are fond of saying to people from away like me when they help us off a rock, you can't get the chart is not the sea. The chart is not the sea. The travel, you're a travel guide who makes maps. The map is not the geography, but in a way it is. Because once we enter the geography, we perceive it, its reality, according to the map we have in our brain. But, but Interpretation, in other words, is the way we human beings interact with what's real. Are, are those, but I, I, yeah. I, I distance myself from, the, from embracing this whole subjectivity because I have the illusion that certain truths that people like me find now will be found by totally unrelated people, people coming from different backgrounds, using different instruments and different st scientific strategies 10, 20, and 100 years from now. That's the pretentious world I live in. Uh, and, and if I didn't think that, I wouldn't want to be doing this because I wouldn't want to make everything that we discover contingent on what happens to be the ideological favorite view of biology this year or next year. Right, and, and it, it seems like there are, there are potentially two different things that, that are being discussed here. One is this um, dichotomy between asking questions of what is and what does it mean, and then there's the issue of perception and how our individual and human perception affects all of our knowledge and everything that affects both of those questions. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you don't need to get into the issues of perception to look at what is and what does it mean as two different, two, two sort of fundamentally different questions that lead to two fundamentally different fields. Well, again, going back to the abstract question of what do we mean by knowing, and I take it, my, my philosophical ground, my assumption, which is pre-rational, I can't prove it, is that we, we, we know by imagining, we know by creating what Aquinas calls a phantasm of reality, and we, the phantasm stands between us and the reality. There's a mediation that's going on, and that mediation is the place of meaning. And while, Robert, you're, surely the experiments you're conducting now can be repeated in another time in another culture, but I would, I would argue, without a lot of authority, that the meaning necessarily will be different. The fact, the fact of the perception in the experiment may be identical. If, if you've done it right, it will be. But what it means to those scientists will be different from what it means to you. And, that, and I don't think you get knowledge until you match the, the, the fact of the object known with the knower, and the knower is always conditioned. Er, again, you know, I'm stuck with Aquinas. Aquinas' wonderful aphorism, 
all knowledge comes to the receiver in the mode of the receiver, not in the mode of what's known. Uh, so you started your anecdote by going to a professor and asking about interpretation. You said, I can't give you the exact quote, maybe you remember it, how do I interpret this? And that was the, the, you, that was the moment of the end of communication with the professor who banished you to philosophy. But interpretation is the issue. Interpretation in your work has to be the issue, Robert. Rebecca, well, do you, well, let, let, I think Rebecca has something to say. Um, well, I mean, actually what I wanted out of physics uh, was to tell me what is, what is, right? What kind of world are we living in? And he wasn't willing to, to use at least quantum mechanics in those days in, in, in that way. Uh, it's different now, actually. Um, but um, so you want, you were looking for what is and not what does it mean, and he yeah, just because it mattered to me to know right. what is right? right. So I mean, yes, yeah, so these things are you know they're it's human, and I totally agree with you. You know the the false dichotomy between imagination and intellect, and between uh, intellect and and um, emotion. This is this is false, and and certainly any kind of dichotomy in terms of valuation, what which one is is more important uh, than the other. Um, but um, what knowledge is, what a philosopher th defines knowledge of, uh, is, is a justified true belief, right? Um, and, but the way different questions can be justified using different means. It's interesting to me that you keep going back to Aquinas, because of course Aquinas is pre-scientific. I mean, the, the, he, he was trying to, uh, he was working within the Aristotelian system. This was uh, Aristotle. Uh, uh, it was a purely speculative system. It was using certain intuitions and, 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 and carrying them forward. Uh, but it was, not, it was not science. And um, it was not trying to probe reality to answer us back, uh, to correct any of our intuitions. Um, it's amazing. We, we landed on this technique. I mean, it. it Aristotelianism with its teleology had a lot of uh, years going, and we didn't really get anywhere. Uh, and then, you know, man, we wedded together uh, mathematics, observation, certain of our, our observations. We can um, abstract certain aspects of it. Galileo called those the primary qualities, and, and, and translate them into mathematical language. The book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, right, uh, Galileo said. And then, because his critics were so stupid, <laughs> testing. I mean, that is the key thing. Thank that God to be for able, stupid critics. The stupid critics, right? Let's hear it for stupidity. Um, so th not all questions can be submitted to this, to this methodology. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and these questions about what it means to be human, and, and mm -hmm. um, these are not questions that can be submitted. It's amazing we, we, we came up with this technique. We've gotten as far as we're doing string theory. That's amazing that with these hunter-gatherer brains, we managed to, to do off. this. Yeah, I mean, it, it pays we, off. It, we didn't come up with it by accident. It pays off. Bob, could you have something it's taken us far. Well, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to say one thing. Keep in mind that when I, when the things that I do, I'm talking about my discipline, uh, I, I have the hope or the, the pretense that uh, other people 10, 20, and 50 years from now will find the same thing. But there's even a more pretentious uh, and ambitious uh, thought there, and that is if somebody were to come down from Mars and had the tools of investigation right. that we did, we do, but had obviously a quite different kind of brain than we do, this entity, whatever it would be, would also converge on the same set of conclusions about the reality of the physical world. And in that sense, if that, if that pretension is, is correct of mine, for example, then the whole I intervention of the human mind becomes almost a historical artifact of how one led, found something rather than a, an important constituent of its reality. And, but that's not a pretension of yours, it's a pretension of science. Yes. Right. Um, or at least, as we call it sometimes, the hard sciences. Right, uh, yeah. Uh, um, let, let me just uh, put in a word of defense for Aquinas here. <laughs> uh, without, without Aquinas, no Galileo. No, I'd say without Plato, no Galileo. Plato, uh, Galileo was drenched in the Timaeus. Uh, which was the one, uh, the one 
uh, dialogue of Plato that well, we actually could, was taught. Well, in I, I wouldn't say age. without. I, I wouldn't say only Aquinas, but what I mean by that is Aquinas lifts up the absolute importance of what he calls sensory knowledge, which is a rescue from Plato, uh, for whom knowledge is essentially abstraction. If, if we really want to get into philosophy, we could say without anything that happened in the past, the future as we know it wouldn't exist. But uh, that's probably a whole other um, forum. Um, Alan, there is, there's one thing before I open it up that I want to make sure I ask you about. And that's um, when you are engaged in these two different practices uh, in physics and in writing fiction, um, do you go into that with not fundamentally different questions that you're asking, but is the drive that leads you um, to create and to, uh, uh, to explore and investigate and produce in these two dramatically different fields, does that feel like it comes from the same place? In 30 seconds or less, please. Well, the, the creative moment, which is one of the main motivations, it's, it's like a drug. Um, that feels to me exactly the same. And so yeah. how would you describe the creative moment in physics? Well, I'll describe it when you, uh, you've been struggling with a problem and uh, you suddenly see it in a different way. You, you have a different perspective and you, you see the solution to the problem. Uh, and in that moment where you, you have this experience, um, you're totally free of your ego. Um, your ego comes in strongly later on, maybe when you're deciding where you should publish the results and so on. But, but, but in that moment where you're finding out something no, new that you didn't know before, maybe that no one knew before, it's an ego-free state. It's a state that's where you don't know where you are or you don't know what time it is. You're just understanding something. And, and it's, it's a very beautiful experience, and I, I think uh, I've had that, uh, I've been lucky enough to have it a few times in science. Do you experience the same thing when you're, when you're creating fiction? Yes. And so where, at what point does it come? It sounds like it comes at the end of the process, almost, or near the end of the process, when you're, when you're uh, uh, looking at a problem in physics. Well, I think you have to have a prepared, a prepared mind in either, in any of these disciplines, to have this creative experience. Um, I did a, a, a survey about 10 years ago of great discoveries in science in the 20th century in all different fields. And in I your, found- Your book, The Discoveries. Yes. Yeah. And I found that in no cases were the great discoveries made by amateurs. There were, there were some cases where scientists found uh, things unexpectedly. But in all cases, the scientists had done their homework they had developed the craft of the tool of, of the trade. They had the knowledge. They knew where the frontier was. Uh, and that's what I mean by the prepared mind. Right. Um, I think we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, I will take the, the uh, I, I might grab things back um, during this. But for the moment, we're going to open up to questions. I would love to start with uh, Mary Fuller, um, who, uh, as I mentioned before, was a big part of why we're all here. Thanks so much, Seth, and thanks to the panelists, and especially Alan, for putting this together. It's really a pleasure to get to continue this conversation a little bit more expansively. Um, I want to say two things, and I guess the first one is that I feel like we, uh, it's, this is a discussion that I feel is perhaps not getting as much traction as it might, because we're operating at a very high level of abstraction and not defining terms very well. So, you know, if you take a term like ambiguity, I think that perhaps it's being used in the sense of vagueness. I think about it rather differently um, from the perspective of literature. I think of ambiguity as something where uh, there are multiple, uh, a set of values that are possible simultaneously, and that it's a device or a situation that one could describe in very rigorous ways and then has particular affordances. Do, do you mean there, there are multiple sets of values? That, could... that, there, that there may be a, multiple values that are right. possible that right. one can't decide between. You know, and this is the kind of thing that people in literature sort of study and characterize and, 
are interested in. Um, and, and I'll just say one word about ambiguity. The reason that this came into the discussion, I think, between Alan and myself was that a colleague here in material science said to me, you know, the humanities are value because, valuable because they teach our students to deal with ambiguity, and you can't be a good scientist unless you can reckon with it. Now, I should have asked him to characterize more exactly what he meant by ambiguity. Um, but unfortunately, he didn't, and he's not here, so I can't speak for him. Um, but another thing that struck me is that, uh, you know, the sciences and the humanities, I think in this discussion, are being characterized in what to me is a somewhat peculiar way. I would characterize them differently. It's such a big question, right? But if, if you take uh, the pendulum as representing science, right, and the sort of, you know, something like Descartes saying, what do I know as the humanities, then you get things that are very, very different. But to me, it's interesting to think about the things that are in the middle of the spectrum that are something more like cartography or a history of the universe. And I was struck, Alan, that you sort of bracketed cosmology as not being one of the sciences that you were going to talk about. Um, because there are many things that one wants to know about what is that involve the past that are not repeatable, that do fall within the domain of science. And perhaps that's why I find cosmology and planetary science so intellectually congenial. You know, because they're, they're like the work that I do, um, which is fairly historical. But even if I put on the non-historical hat, I would say that, for instance, an aesthetic object is one of the things it is. And a lot of my practice is to describe that object in ways that are fairly empirical, um, not to sort of to, to sit down and start having ideas about it. Often I don't know how to have ideas until I describe it, until I characterize it very accurately. Um, now, that's completely unlike setting up a pendulum and making a repeatable experiment. But when, I have, when I've made a rigorous description of the aesthetic object, and then I might form a hypothesis about it, the way that I test that hypothesis is to say, how much of this, how many of these connections, how many of the things that exist in this poem become more meaningful if on this hypothesis? Right? And so, you know, I'm not, that's not science. Um, but it's, that's what I think of as the humanities. That's the humanities that I practice. It's not a humanities of sort of what is inside my head, right? It is a humanities of my encounter with the object that's outside me. And I think that um, a historian would probably say something fairly similar. Um, so if we set, you know, um, perhaps versions of field science um, or historical science, let's call it, next to other versions of the humanities like history, we might be having a different conversation. Mary, I actually have a question for you. Uh, so would you describe what you do as fundamentally um, looking backward in the sense that you're looking at what is already there? Mm -hmm. And so is that possibly a, a one useful way to make a distinction that in science we're trying to um, uh, describe the world as it might be in terms of we want something to be reproducible throughout the future? And in the humanities, we're looking at things that have already happened and only things that have already happened. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that everybody would agree with that description of the humanities. Probably true. <laughs> Wait, you're not sure that everyone <laughs> would agree with the description right. of the humanities as, as... As being about the past. OK, well, so then I'm open to hearing other, uh, uh, other ideas. But is, I mean, do, does anyone on the panel have a notion of the humanities as... Um, something other than an interpretation of reality as we have already known it. We have been analyzing contemporary culture as well, the humanities. I mean, art is being produced um, even as we speak, and uh, um, um, you know, it's often there is a uh, you know the humanities are dealing with that as well. I'm really interested in what you say about ambiguity um, because. Um, I mean, actually, in my two hats as working as a philosopher and working as a novelist, I think about um, if, if, if you scientists don't like ambiguity, analytic philosophers detest it, uh, right? It is, we, we make a, a fetish out of clarity, maybe because we're dealing with such murky issues, and so it's so very important to be as clear as you possibly can. Um, and it's interesting to me when I'm writing a novel how, and it, it's hard actually, because the part of me that, that detests ambiguity has to be laid to rest a little bit. 
um, when you're creating a work, you know, when you're creating art, um, there is a, a, an intentional um, ambiguity there, or, or, or porousness, maybe, actually. You can't fill in all the details because what you're trying to do, it seems to me, um, is to create a, a deep and rich experience in some unknown people out there, right? Um, and that they have to somehow be able to move into what you've created there, this matrix that you've created there, uh, with their own experiences, their own subjectivity, um, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and create their own experiences. And so there has to be this porousness um, and, and openness so that they can that they can move in. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a thick, it's, it's knowing, you know, what you, you, to provide and what to leave out. And when I was a very new novelist, um, I would often be horrified to hear what a reader would make of my work. Right. And you know, so oh, I loved your book. You know, it was all about blah blah blah. No, what? No, it wasn't about that at all. How could you possibly? Last thing I was thinking of. Um, that's you know, I was coming from the sciences and philosophy where you don't, you know, you're trying to lay things out. And then, um, you know, I realized, well, no, this is in fact what you have to do. It's, if, if they're able to move in and create their own experience, um, even though it's nothing that I thought about, um, that's one of the major differences between, um, you know, being a scientist or philosopher and being, being a, a, an artist. So I think that, you know, sort of cultivated, intentional uh, ambiguity is part of the art of, of being, of being a writer. Um, that that actually might be a, a sort of better way to describe what I was getting at, which is um, thinking of the humanities as an interpretive discipline as opposed to uh, an empirical discipline. Um, Chris, introduce yourself. And Sure, thank you. My name is uh, Chris Peterson. I uh, work and teach and research here. Um, so we've heard a pretty consistent definition of the sciences tonight, which I try to position somewhere in this space of uh, creating progressively more <laughs> stable and coherent descriptions of some external world. But I don't know that we've heard a great definition of the humanities or specifically the human character that's inside the humanities and what that means. And the, maybe the most consistent thing I've heard articulated by the various people in the panel is this thing about ambi ambiguity, whatever that means, although it seemed to mean a lot about unpredictability. And there's been something about uh, humanity being co-defined with unpredictability, at least in the Christian um, tradition that you know, James Carroll's been talking about since at least the time of the fall, right? So you've got you know, interactions with natural act, uh, actors like humans and snakes, and unpredictable things happen, and that's what gives you a fundamentally human character. But we also used to give all sorts of essentially human agency to non-human actors like the sea you know, and the sun um, because we didn't yet understand what they did. But as soon as science has come in and made them predictable, we now view those unproblematically as within the domain of science. And if that's the case, is human just another word for what science cannot yet predict? And if that's true, how useful is it as a meaningful conceptual category? Who wants to tackle that? Uh, you, you, you may have stumped the panel. Well, I, I would offer a, a, a simple thought about it, which what is a human being? I, that's embedded in part of what you, what you said. And, I, I would suggest the human being is an image-making creature. And I, I would see that describing both the enterprise of science and the enterprise of what we're calling the humanities here, image-making creatures. And I, speaking certainly as no scientist, but I understand science as a process of image-making. And uh, I don't accept the distinction you just made between the interpretive discipline and the empirical discipline, because I th I'm arguing that the empirical discipline has to be interpretive. And we interpret by virtue of the images we make, or the stories we tell, the narratives we create. Experience is chaotic and without order. The imagination is the human faculty of creating or imposing order. We put a beginning, a middle, and an end on chaotic experience. We create a narrative, a story, and it has meaning for us. And I see that as the enterprise of the laboratory as much as, much as of the poet's workbench. 
Um, Jim, aren't... Uh, and, and let me just finally say, this activity is inevitably ambiguous because an image is never actually and fully identical with the thing it images. So there's a built-in ambiguity to this enterprise, whether it's humanities or science. Sorry, Robert. Well, uh, aren't you really saying that humanities is about the human mind and, and, and soul uh, and the vagaries that flow from that, whereas science is, is about the outside world that exists independent of what kind of soul and mind we have? It's there, uh, whereas humanities is, is exploring everything that flows from our own internal human idiosyncrasies. So well, the humanities are also responding to the outside world every bit as much, so that when you get a great novel, uh, War and Peace about the uh, invasion of Russia is very much the outside world that is the subject of the novel. Mm, no, it's, not. it's certainly that the interior experience of those who undergo that invasion <laughs> is central, but it's very much the world at large that's being responded to. Well, our, our internal experience is always, you know, partly a response to, sure. to, to, to the outside because world. Because we're embodied beings. Yeah. Okay. But, and, but, but in fact, you know, I mean, the humanities are about what it's like to be a human, uh, what it uh, is like to, to have a human life, uh, including that, you know, the subjectivity, the inner world, which is partly a response to one's own character, but also uh, in interaction with, with, with events that are going on, and including interaction with um, uh, what we're finding out about science. Uh, Alan and I both like to write novels uh, that have, um, that are about discovering scientific truths and, and, and what that means in a human life. Uh, but it is, I mean, uh, to live a human life is to, to, to occupy the spheres of, of meaning and mattering. Uh, we occupy different mattering maps, right? Different things matter to us. Um, and this is, um, this actually, this idea of a mattering map was an idea that I came up with in a novel uh, tried to make it pretty precise. And then many decades later, I discovered that um, it had taken on a life of its own, including a scientific life of its own, that it's uh, been used in, um, in uh, behavioral economics. So if you Google mattering map, you will get so many hits, many more hits than you'll get if you Google me even though it was my term, because it has been adapted, although it was proposed in a novel, it's actually been uh, adapted as a theoretical construct in behavioral economics. Um, so, but anyway, I mean, it's, it is this, this thing, you know, it's, it's a world of mattering, it's a human world, and, and an exploration of that, including, um, you know, our interactions with, with the external world, including, you know, uh, the world as it's described by science, because that matters to us. That's part of our interpretation of what it means to be human. Yeah. But Bob, I, I want to circle back really quickly to something you said when you were talking about Martians coming down um, and having the same tools that we did, they would get the same results. And it seems like one distinction here is that even if Martians came down and had literature, and then experienced um, uh, Russia, and they still might not produce war and peace. In fact, it would, they probably would not produce war and peace. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of what we're talking about here in terms yeah, of? Yeah, and, and I would say that, that war and peace, and it was the War of 1812, was it not, that was being described, was also one of the multiple things that flows out of the soul and the vagaries of the human mind, out of the, the soul of, uh, and mind of Napoleon and, and uh, of the Tsar and of the Russian people and of the French people and all the entire flow of European history. And all of those things are secondary, tertiary, and quaternary consequences of the human experience, yeah. but not of any fixed truths right. of the physical world. As yeah. opposed to what you're yeah. up to, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not yeah. saying what I'm yeah. up to is any better, but yeah. it yeah. is right. different. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Chris Meyer, and I think my question follows on the, on the previous question fairly consequently. Um, first of all, props to the destructive dichotomy. And I think we um, are perhaps overestimating the dichotomy, and a couple of reasons why, followed by a question. Ambiguity seems to me ineluctably present in both realms, right? We have Gödel's theorem that tells us we either have contradictions or incompletions. We have the uncertainty principle. We have Stuart Kostman's work that says 
you cannot pre-state the configuration of a complex system. Uh, so science has proven at many levels that we cannot know everything. And perhaps it's just that people who like to explore ambiguity are doing things we call humanist, and people who like to avoid ambiguity are making their living, as, as Bob pointed out, doing the things where those ambiguities don't affect our ability to, to keep the airplane up. Um, so they share that, that tolerance for ambiguity, although they may deal with it in different ways. And keep in mind that people like, like me don't pretend we can know everything. Yeah. All we pretend is that we can know a finite number of things with great solidity and lack of ambiguity. Well, and you have a different objective from somebody well, who's exploring the human. Our, our objectives are almost irrelevant. OK. So here's my, my question is, it's been, since we stumbled on this method, the scientific method, it's been a lot easier to make a laboratory for the physical sciences than for social science or humanism. You know, you could, you could imagine a, a continent with thousands of Truman Show domes in it and testing different people in the same dome, perhaps, but it's not practical or hasn't been. But here we live in a time where quantified self is happening, where all kinds of individual data is appearing, where we have the power to deal with that data, where we've learned to do agent-based models of, that create emergent properties in societies, including models of civil violence, which can't today pr uh, predict the War of 1812, but seem to predict the extinction of the Anasazi Indians. Can you imagine that it's just that our study of, of what we think of as the human condition is way behind because we don't have the laboratories, and we are developing better laboratories to do experiments, and of course, recent evidence suggests that a lot of scientific experiments don't have the rep Replicability, we thought they did, but where we can do experiments, test for replicability, and, and expand uh, the ability to understand human beings in a more scientific way. That's my question. It, I mean, that, does, does that question get into um, a, a moral issue of, of what you can actually do to humans to find results? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't no. do a Truman Show scenario. Unless you consider Facebook experiments on people. To be you know, inhumane? Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> you might. <laughs> but I mean, I, no, but, I, well, you, you, I, you don't have to have active experiments on people to, do, to learn things from um, information about behavior at the individual level. I, I, I think yes. that experiments on people, independent of whether they're humane or inhumane, are intrinsically flawed because the complexity of the human mind and its various manifestations is so enormous that we have no idea how to begin to, to reduce. Isn't, isn't that what we said about the mind of God before Galileo? Well, it could be the case that 100 years from now, we will be, we'll be able to speak more about the variability and the, and the multiple independent variables of the human mind with greater precision. But now it's vastly beyond our ability even to discuss it in any intelligent way. And so uh, I, I, uh, I hear with amusement the yeah. notion that uh, if only we had better tools and better laboratories, we could reduce uh, the human mind and its workings to some kind of predictable processes, because I don't believe it. Yeah, but um, you know, there are many people who would make the argument that um, uh, the advance of, um, of the behavioral sciences has, has um, is already shedding light on the uh, typical subjects of the humanities, that evolutionary psychology um, is offering uh, uh, arguments about how we evolved our moral systems. Um, there's uh, evolutionary aesthetics. There's even neuroaesthetics uh, that is, that is uh, giving, um, studying what the brain is doing, which parts of the brain are being um, excited in fMRI machines when one is undergoing various different kinds of aesthetic experiences. Um, I mean, so there are, there are, in fact, scientists, especially in um, evolutionary psychology, who would claim 
um, look, you know, we really do have light to shed on, on the humanities, on the typical subjects of the humanities. And um, it's really been uh, people in the humanities who have kind of resisted this. Are, are you going to colonize? It's not enough that you're taking up all the real estate on these campuses. You're going to colonize <laughs> us as well, right, with your big data and your, and your scientific theories. So, you know, I do think there is still room for this kind of interpretative uh, hermeneutics uh, that uh, you know the humanities um, cultivates that it's a different it's a different kind of discipline, but there there definitely is um, communication between the sciences and and humanities, and I I think that's that's really good. I think there should be more. I think the uh, the advances in the behavioral sciences do have something to, to, to shed some light. And we don't have to do any nefarious experimenting. Uh, well, some nefarious experimenting. But. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph Searing. I'm a researcher here. Uh, in my brief academic travels so far, I have come to perceive what I would call a troubled relationship between the academy and activism. Uh, and my guess would be that that has something to do with uh, of course, varying by field, uh, a different understanding of the nature of objectivity. Uh, and I'm wondering if any of you would like to come on to that or shoot me down or have any other ideas. Well, tell us what you mean by activism. Um, that's a complicated question. Uh, I think. Well, is there general... a specific scenario that you're, is, is there a situation that you're thinking of or referring to? Uh, not one specific. Uh, I think I'm considering most within the emerging parts of sociology and gender studies and race studies, a tendency to be more um, politically and socially active, uh, as well as developing new knowledge. Uh, and I think I find um, some disagreement with that principle from other uh, approaches and fields. I, I guess one question to ask is to what extent are different kinds of activism driven by pre-existing ideological preconceptions mm -hmm. rather than by some pretense of objectively uh, analyzing a situation and saying that the situation dictates one thing or another. And uh, in fact, activism is indeed, the perception of activism is strongly tainted by the notion that many activists, for better or worse, really come to the, the solution of a problem carrying already a, a large amount of ideological baggage even before they became, as it were, activists. I mean, certainly on the issue of global warming, um, you know, there has been activism among scientists. I mean, scientists have, have, have stood up and wanted to, you know, have offered their expertise, uh, not ideological expertise, but scientific, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and it's a kind of activism. Uh, and. I don't know if that's what you, what you have in mind, but, but it's founded on, on objectivity. Jim? Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Rebecca, because it does strike me that I, I'm mystified myself that the activism of scientists who have helped us understand the threat of global warming has been so limited. Mm -hmm. The testimony of scientists is powerful, but there's nothing equivalent to the profound embrace of activism that we saw among scientists at a crucial moment in the Cold War. Here, the Union of Concerned Scientists 45 years ago, the scientists on both sides of the Iron Curtain who began actually to carry the banner. They were the leading activists in raising questions about the arms race, arms reduction, the entire arms reduction regime. A lot of it, a lot of the activist impulses centered among scientists here. Uh, was, I, I would argue, and I, I think it's a, a ready case can be made, that was the most single most important fact that enabled the Cold War to turn. And it was scientists on both sides of the Iron Curtain who shed their shyness about activism and became radical activists. I don't know, is that in the background of the question you're asking? Yes, I think so. Alan, did you have a thought there? Did you have a thought, or were you just... You well, don't need I, to have a thought. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. No, I'll, I'll leave the time to the okay. audience. OK. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> my name is David Rush. I'm a retired professor at Tufts. Spent my life as a, an epidemiologist and a scientist. There were two things that I'd like to comment on. One was the sense of revelation that 
Alan Lightman described, because that's exactly how it worked for me. Uh, I had about one good idea a year, and I was some years I missed, but, you know, and I didn't go into the laboratory sciences because when I was taking quantitative analysis, I had to scrape my preparations off the floor, and I, I just figured I would do something different. So I became an epidemiologist. I use statistics. I use I have to deal with human populations. I have to deal with multivariate situations. And what one of the there are two stages of that revelation. One is what question am I interested in? And the second stage is how can I answer that question? And I would challenge Dr. Weinberg, Professor Weinberg, say how you choose your questions. In my own field, I see so many pieces of stupid research where obvious answered questions are re-answered over and over and over again because they're obvious and they're easy. But, but I think you and the Martian might have very different experiences generating the questions. I suspect he wouldn't work on the same problems you do, although you might have gotten the same answers if you had proposed the same questions. I don't doubt for a moment that your work is replicable, but why do you do your work? What is it that makes you want to answer the question you ask if it's not something to say about cancer? That's very activist from my point of view. Well, keep in mind, I, I didn't say that the, uh, uh, let's not ascribe to me something I didn't say. I, I didn't say that the, the Martian would necessarily be interested in examining the same uh, issue or question that I had. Right. What I did say is if they happened to examine the same question, they would converge on the same uh, um, answer. Uh, however, addressing your point more directly, for me, the greatest difficulty and the greatest challenge in training young scientists is to impart and instill in them a taste for what is uh, interesting and conceptually consequential uh, and has ramifications for much work of others and what is trivial and simply a data, data gathering for its own sake. And there is a great distinction there. And to my mind, uh, to the extent that I have the, the pretense or the hope of training really good young scientists who are creative and innovative, it is impressing on them the critical importance of constantly asking themselves, why am I doing this? Is this an important question? Or is this one which gives me satisfaction for the sole purpose, for the, for the sole reason that I'm just gathering more and more uh, almost uninterpretable information? So. Of course, I agree with you completely. I think that creative element, though, is not one that one can describe quite as, as, as securely as the result that arises from answering you're, the question. You're absolutely right. Okay. So we're of one mind. It's clear, it, 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 it's clear that the, the person missing on this panel is the Martian, who would have been able to answer a lot of these questions. Yes. I, thanks a lot for all, uh, to all of you for being here. Um, I'm Daniel Gross. I'm a journalist. Um, so we've talked a lot about, the, or we've tried to, to gra grapple with the nature of knowledge. We haven't spoken much about the transmission of knowledge um, in concrete terms. And maybe a way to, to pose that in a less abstract way is, um, what did we learn from Shakespeare or some literary figure? And how does that compare to what we learned from Darwin, say? And just a really quick anecdote to maybe push back um, on the notion that science can be transmitted in, a, in an uncomplicated way. Um, I knew a student of biology who learned uh, the structure of cells with diagrams. And on the exam, he received a picture of a cell. And none of the students were able to identify the mit mitochondria or the nuclei because they had, they had learned with images and had never encountered what is. Hmm. So, Does anyone want to tackle Shakespeare versus Darwin? Well, I mean, if it's true that a great work of art, Shakespeare produced many of them, um, is, uh, you know, is going to vary uh, with each reader because they bring their own subjectivity to merge with what Shakespeare has created. Um, and, and, uh, um, and it's funny because I was just today uh, at, the, at, at the gym talking to somebody about King Lear. And, um, and we had very, very different experiences. We'd both Typical recently- Typical gym discussion. Exactly, right, right in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right. yes. Um, and so, 
Um, you know, we, 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 because of what both of us are going through right now in our lives, we both had turned to King Lear. Uh, but we're going through something different, and so we were reading different things. Uh, we were reading two different plays. Um, but what we can study is um, Shakespeare's techniques. I mean, how he was able to do this. What do we learn from Shakespeare? Well, we learn how to create these amazing um, works of art, and the kinds of techniques that he used, the kind of openness and porousness and ambiguity that he cultivates, uh, so that you know all of these hundreds of years later, two people you know can sit in the gym and find themselves there, find answers there. Um, but it won't. But they're not going to be the same because they're not the same experiences um, in the way that when I read you know Newton. Um, I know what he was saying, uh, you know, or when I re read a, a mathematical proof, you know, if I read Euclid, I know what he was saying there, you know, that kind of precision. Um, and so, although the, the take on the origin of species, um, it seems very possible that two people in a gym in Cambridge uh, could have a conversation about that, and it could mean very different things to the two of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the. The ultimate salient points that yeah. are distilled from the origin of species would ultimately converge if you pushed the logic to its extreme to a relatively small number of re reasonably well articulated uh, principles. Um, it's not as if uh, the conclusions from, from Darwin would or, or, or should be uh, shaped by one's personal but, experience but, as a human but, being. But you could read on the origin of species and come away from that um, with a different sense of wonder at the universe and not any. Certainly that. Not any more sophisticated understand. Not uh, You could come away not actually understanding any of the specifics of what Darwin was talking about in terms of evolutionary theory yep. and still have it be a very profound experience. Yep. That's right. a literary experience. Yeah. Right, right. right. Also, of, a, I mean, of a scientific work. We might read it very, very differently because, you know, in his day to say what he was saying to the expunging design right, right. from the universe was a very different experience uh, than it is for us in the in the 21st century you know it was a, a, a radical and you know anti uh, many of the firm beliefs right, right. And, you know so you know it was certainly a different experience but 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 the the, the aspects of the theory um, yeah, I mean, to understand the theory is to understand what Darwin was saying, what he was asserting, and the grounds on which he was saying it. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Coles from the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, just like I said, this is my first MIT event I've been to, and uh, it set the bar pretty high for the level of sort of insight and uh, conversation which has come out of it. So thank you very much. Um, there's a fallacy of the, you know, over inquisitive child who asks their science teacher, um, you know, who who invented. Uh, yeah, who invented electricity? Um, you know, to get in the sense that you know, obviously electricity was discovered, but it, that sort of fallacious question gets the point of the difference between what is knowable and what is kind of usable. Although there's a two, um, there's a kind of an interesting relationship there, I think. So I suppose my perhaps equally simple question to you is: uh, Was science, by which I mean the scientific method, invented or discovered? And it's a bit of a trick question because I think the answer is probably that it was invented. I think probably all of you would agree that's the case. Um, so I think because of that, it sort of suggests to me that we maybe can't choose what we find. And indeed, the scientific method is constructed to make sure that we can't choose what we find. But we can choose what we look for. And maybe to put it a bit more pertinently, but more succinctly, we can't choose what we find, but we can choose what we fund. And there's, there's you know, a reason we pour billions of dollars into cancer research, but not into you know, bruised knees, for example. Um, in terms, so I think that, that maybe that, um, that decision-making is our human agency over the scientific process. So I think maybe the, the point I put out there is that, you know, that the reality is that there's a lot of reality out there, but the act of shining the searchlight is our active interpretation. It's not technically interpretation, but it's the process of discovery is a very powerful process which we as humans and as scientists do control. No, nobody would, would quarrel with you if, if you say that what we end up finding represents a subset of what can be found in the objective outside universe, and that what we end up finding is in no small part dictated by what we've looked for, and what we've looked for is in no small part dictated by the culture around us, including the political and the scientific culture. But still, I would maintain that if a scientist discovers something and it's rigidly demonstrated, 
it's independent of how he got or how she got to that point, the truth of what he or she discovered will still be robust and survive the test of time. Alan, well, well, I just wanted to respond to your comment that, that, uh, about the development of the scientific method. And you said, was it discovered or invented? And I think you said it was invented. Um, I think the scientific method was, 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 was found uh, as a process of, of uh, natural selection, Trial and intellectual natural selection. That um, it's a method uh, that, in Rebecca's language, um, a method of inquiry that allows us to ask questions in and, and, and such a way that nature will answer. And those answers have allowed us to develop antibiotics. They've allowed us to design cell phones and iPhones. They've uh, improved the quality of life. They, they pay off. So we, we found the scientific method over time because it's, it's a method of, of inquiry and of, of being in the world that allows us to improve our quality of life. So I don't think that, you know, it's, uh, I, I think uh, that one can apply the same logic and, and argument to, the, to its development as we do to other things that develop by natural selection. Yeah, you know, David Deutsch, in, um, he has a new book out, The Beginning of Infinity, and um, he argues there that you know, the, any intelligence in the universe would eventually come on our scientific method, that we don't have to worry, you know, in, in all of the science fiction, uh, that there is this kind of, you know, Martian, you know, who, who comes and, and, and has a completely different way of knowing. Um, so he argues there that, you know, this thing that we evolved, um, amazing, that it is, it, it, it is the way to know what is, and any intelligence in the universe would have um, come on the very same one. I, think you know, you, I don't know if that's true, but, but it's, it's very well argued. If you sincerely believe that it was kind of a cultural artifact, a scientific method, then I would challenge you to propose an alternative to the scientific method that would no, be I, no, I, efficacious. I, I think it survived the test of time. Um, I mean, just a, a very brief background. I just finished a project looking at the impact of big data on the social sciences. And that's a really Can fascinating... Can you talk a little more slowly? Sorry, yeah. Looking at the impact of big data on the social sciences. And that's, for me, it's provoked some of these questions in you because the sort of the, the general sense behind it is that this is the we'll have n equals all, we'll have all the data in the world, we need not ask any more questions. But of course, that's very much a fallacy as well. I think we do need, still need questions and we'll still be the ones to, to ask them. But I think, as, I think that's absolutely right about the scientific method. I think it, it's, it's the one that's maybe the least worst option <laughs> mm -hmm. that we have so far. Yes, over here. Uh, my name is Peter Walsh. Um, I have had in my career several experiences of working with scientists in a way which allowed me to see the sausage making of science. And some of this, although I did not realize this at the time, some of the science I was observing being stuffed into casing was um, important. It was a cutting edge science, which is uh, considered important today. What I concluded from that experience was that the process of making science, at least from my observation, was much closer to a novel than it was to a controlled experiment. In other words, enormous amount of plot, drama, uh, twists, suspense, ambiguity, uh, contradictions, twists and turns. Um, Are you talking about the story It's not a of safe this? controlled process. And so my question is, have we made, to some extent, kind of a plaster state of science by kind of ignoring the little messy parts like, <coughs> Um, Newton's alchemy and, and Galileo's uh, astrology and, and so forth. Are we making it too simplified to really appreciate what science is about? And just a, a clarifying question, are you referring to the, the process of science, so the way science is done in a laboratory, or are you referring I'm, to I'm saying the process that, of finding questions? I'm saying that without getting too running too far off all the libel laws. There, were, there was a lot of personal stuff going on with the process of science. And there was a lot of people being upset, 
anger, right. communicating in different ways, refusing to listen to each other, refusing to believe each other, not coming together, uh, making accusations, Does political that, accusations, well, uh, uh, you know, I, I often, mess of stuff. I often say the trouble with science is it's done by human beings. Right. Uh, I often say, uh, maybe once a week, the trouble with science is it's done by human beings. And already twice tonight. Yes, I've said it twice tonight. Uh, and uh, the, the question to my mind is not whether it's done by human beings, yes. or to quote another experience, uh, uh, another saying, the reason why academic disputes such as those in science are so nasty and bitter is that the stakes are so low. And, and um, the, the, the question to me is not whether science occasionally has personalities and egomanias in it. The issue for me, and I think the issue for us tonight is, are the end results of the process, as messy and dirty and sausage making as it is, are the end results, are they something worthy of admiration and are they robust and will they stand the test of time independent of the egomaniacs who created them? I'm, I right. don't mean right. to be pejorative of that process. You're, you're, you're perfectly privileged to be uh, 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 pejorative uh, that is, that is because I know lots of scientists who my, fit my well your description. And the intention of my question is to say, um, you know, this, watching this process was fascinating to me and watching how it worked is fascinating to me. And we... to me, the messiness of it was, and the way the messiness was kind of globbed together like lumps of clay, basically, was an essential part of science. It wasn't an accidental part of science. It wasn't a negative part of science. Um, I think we, under, I mean, I think we understand what you're. What's that? I think we understand what you're saying. Um, I, the only reason I'm cutting you off is because there we don't have much time and we have some more questions. But uh, I think you know that's an. It seems like that's an argument for more histories of science. It is um, to some describing extent. the process, but I think we. I think we're clear. So thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I have, I'm an undergraduate here. Well, studying. Just identify yourself. Oh, I'm Yuri Lensky. I'm an undergraduate here studying physics. The only one in the room, maybe. <laughs> um, and so I have sort of a two-part question. Uh, the first one is that, so in science, there's like a clear sense of progress in the sense that you are sort of, you know, climbing a ladder. You have, like, you do some, you learn truths, like, that are objectively true. And as you accumulate more of these facts, you know, some of them might turn out to be not true under different situations, but ideally when you publish a scientific paper, you're specific enough that you say, under these conditions, what I'm saying is true, and that's just a fact. And then maybe, you know, like best example probably, or the easiest one is like Newton. What he said is still true under the conditions that he assumed, and we can still use his laws. We have additional ones because we've probed further, but we've made objective progress. Um, is there such a thing in the humanities because you do have a lot of like social conditions on what the humanities are and something that someone argued 10,000 years ago, there's no, re there's no reason that I see that it's you know, less valid today. Whereas we can objectively say, you know, science has made progress because we have a larger, like more gigabytes of information. Uh, sure. And then the second question, I just will get them both out quickly maybe. Uh, the second question is, there's, I've heard a lot and I've seen a lot of uh, humanities people use, you know, data methods and mathematical analysis, statistical methods, um, and sort of pull from the sciences to help, uh, to help with what they're studying. But are there examples in, I guess, especially physics, but anywhere, where actually the humanities have facilitated in a direct way what scientists have done? And I'd like to avoid, you know, politics or like, you know, hum humanists have argued that science is a good thing, so it got funding, but something used directly by scientists to aid in the scientific process. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've argued um, very strongly in various publications that philosophy makes progress. Um, and in fact, um, because one of the things that philosophy is trying to do is to expand our coherence. Um, and that we, it's, it's a, a constant uh, effort to um, unearth, uh, unexamine presuppositions uh, and, um, um, and, 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 and to question them. Presuppositions that are 
so constitutive of our thinking that, they, that they're completely um, invisible. And that, uh, and it also makes progress because science makes progress. And, and philosophy is always trying to use the, uh, the, the uh, results of science and to reconcile them with other uh, of our intuitions, some of which have to go. Um, and so, I mean, right now, for example, it's a very huge question whether or not the results in neuroscience mean that we have to give up very fundamental views about free will, personal agency, accountability. Um, and this is, uh, you know, philosophy making progress, piggybacking, piggybacking um, on science, but it is, you know, there, nobody's a Cartesian dualist anymore, for example. I mean, that was a very uh, uh, robust view uh, before we had made uh, progress in science. But, but, but also, I mean, and this is a huge argument, um, philosophical um, arguments has, have helped us make moral progress in, in, in uh, uh, unearthing various inconsistencies in our moral point of view. Um, and so Plato, for example, had a really good argument as to why slavery was wrong for Greeks, right? Uh, he had a, but, you know, that argument was, was, was then worked on and uh, universalized, and, you know, slowly we get uh, a universal argument against uh, slavery, that, that it's, it's not just wrong to enslave Greeks, but humans in general. So there, there's that kind of, um, of, of progress, and it, gets, and, and it really is progress that proceeds by way of arguments. Anyway, that's a long argument that well, I would make. To, yeah. to, pick, to, to pick out that slavery point, is, yeah. so is there like some kind of argument that it's not possible to make another argument that slavery is actually OK? Yeah, you know, it's, there's that sense of revelation, uh, uh, that, that aha, um, when, you, when you see that certain ethical commitments that you've already made entail others, right? And so, um, and so that's a kind of growth expansion of, of coherence. So you can give up, you know, the initial intuitions, or, or you have to live with the consequences, right, of, and, and, and apply them. Uh, but in every place in which slavery was abolished, it was never reinstituted, except for um, actually one example, Napoleon in, in Haiti. But in general, these advances are, are kind of discoveries. They're kind of, aha, I'm committed to this. Um, I have to expand uh, my, my commitments. I'm, I'm inconsistent. And that's the way it's been going on ever since Socrates was plying his trade uh, in the Athenian Agora. He upset a lot of people. Uh, by, by asking them to account consistently uh, for their points of view, and they rewarded him with a brimming cup of hemlock. Rebecca, I just want to move on because we have only a couple minutes, and we have, I think we're only going to have time for one more question. I'm sorry. Um, so, Josh, can you identify yourself and ask your question? Hi, I'm Josh Sokol. Uh, I'm a student in the graduate program for science writing here at MIT. So, I've noticed Alan very cleverly dealing with some of the thornier questions of the nature of science by using what I think is a constructive empiricist argument about what science is. So we can avoid the question of whether science is explaining or dealing with truth or knowledge or what is actually there in reality by instead saying that science provides a useful set of explanations, a useful set of heuristics for learning. And that's convincing to me, and I think that that's logically sound. And in the interest of given that this is the last question, of tying together things with as neat a bow as I can manage. Is there a way to say that science, in the empiricist sense, is about heuristics that work and that are demonstrably effective when compared to other methods? Not about the nature of reality, but rather that science works because it works, and that humanity also has similar processes that are obviously applied, and although they cannot be as rigorously defined, they're still clearly useful and informative ways to look at the world and humans? In 30 seconds or less. Well, I, I think that, that discussions about what reality is are really not scientific. Uh, I think that, that ultimately science works because it's able to make predictions about experiments, the results of experiments that are outside of our bodies. And 
so I, I agree with your characterization that it works because it works. And any further uh, characterizations of it, I think, uh, drift into the philosophical realm. So you wouldn't say that we know that there are fermions and bosons, neurons, genes. You're not committed uh, to uh, those existing. Well, when you say we know them, I think that we, that 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 we that uh, our theories of them, our equations about them, allow to make uh, to predictions about the world outside of us. Testability. Testability. So, yeah. So, but but it doesn't expand our ontology beyond our experiences. Well, I think that's another discipline. Uh, two, two, two things before we end. One, um, I, I, I had wanted to bring up Girdle because I thought that that would be a kind of uh, a, a very nice way to address some issues, including math, which didn't come up at all. Um, but the idea that there can be something that is true but not provable um, uh, in mathematics is sort of fascinating. Is a fascinating underlying question. For those of you who don't know, uh, Rebecca's written a book on Girdle. But Jim, I actually had one last question um, for you before we end, and that's we've been talking a lot about um, sort of progress in a scientific sense. And as, as a novelist, um, when you look back over the history of, of, of novels and fiction writing, do you see what's happening as progress? Well, I think progress, forgive me, is an ambiguous idea, and, uh, but a useful one also. And I, I would just say the novel is a modern form, uh, and it, it presumes certain human characteristics that have come into flower in modernity, especially individual freedom and the importance of the individual and the importance of experience. I, as a non-scientist, I take the basic meaning of the scientific method to be experience trumps dogma. And in the scientific method, as elaborated here, experience is testable and, and able to be um, not just argued but demonstrated. But if experience, and I think every novel subject in some way or other is experience trumps dogma or ideology or ideas. Atlas shrugged. The young man who uh, addressed us a few minutes ago asked us to abstract from politics. Uh, that's the element that's been missing from this discussion. You can't abstract from politics because the Enlightenment, in addition to being an, an intellectual revolution, was a political revolution. And at bottom, it was about the coming uh, into power of individuals. And that's the ground of science, and it's the ground of uh, contemporary literary art, uh, because it requires, as George Orwell said, the free play of the mind, which was impossible in the dictatorship of dogmatism, however defined. Uh, it's true, it's political, it's also religious. Uh, Orwell's quote was, the novel is a Protestant art form requiring the free play of the mind. No Catholic can be a good novelist. <laughs> or, or if he is, he's a bad Catholic. So which one, which one are you? I'm yeah. a bad Catholic. Right. Um, so I want to I wanna thank um, our panel uh, and again remind everyone that we will not only be having a reception right outside, um, we will also have books uh, for sale. Um, at the beginning, I, I was so impressed by the fact that Jim had just published a novel in July that I changed the title of his book to Warburg in July. It's actually Warburg in Rome, I realized as soon as I said it. Um, uh, but please join me in giving a very, very warm thanks to the panel. Um, and, and, and please buy books also. <laughs>